All right, so what makes an abortion an interesting philosophical topic is that it focuses on the question of when does human life or personhood begin? And although initially this seems like a question about biology, there are actually philosophical assumptions or philosophical questions that are raised in the nature of the biology. So even when we look at like what makes a person alive or dead, um, it's not always just clearly a heartbeat. Technically doctors use brain activity to determine um, whether someone's uh, dead or alive, but these questions are even harder to answer when it comes down to the nature of human development um, in, in the womb from the get-go. So um, this question of when does human personhood or human life begin is the question that is the focus of Noonan's essay and a most absolute value in history. And so um, there are a couple of other philosophical questions about when a person gets a right to life and what to do when that your right to life competes with someone else's. Those are gonna be the topic of the next um, couple of essays. But Noonan's question is when does human personhood begin? Um, so let me just give you some uh, overview of how Noonan makes his argument. This is typically called an argument by elimination the argument that he makes. And just to explain what elimination is, it's when you say the answer to this question is A, B, C, D, or E. And then you walk through all the different available options and you say, hmm, here's A, it can't be A because this, so now let's go to B. Um, here's B, here's why it can't be B, so let's go to C. So what Noonan is doing is he is eliminating options. So, um, and then after having eliminated all those options, he's left with one option and that option is conception. And so he gives a positive argument for why conception is the correct point. So as you read this article, you'll note that he begins with some preliminary remarks about Christian theology. Um, and he says, you know, basically people would say, well, you know, you can't kill a, you know, a baby person because they have a soul. And he says, well, we can't really identify, you know, anything about souls. This is about Christian theology, although he's working on the Christian tradition, just to be clear about that. But he's trying to make a little bit more of a a secular argument that would be accepted outside of Christianity, but he is rooted within the Christian tradition when he's writing um, this essay. Um, and so what he does is he says, let's look at the points at which people say a fetus becomes a person with moral rights. And he says, then what we're going to find is like, actually those don't work. And he's going to say the only one that it could actually be is conception. So uh, the point that he discusses the, at the beginning, which is viability, is the point at which um, the fetus could survive outside the woman's body if it were disconnected from the woman. So that's viability. He rejects that point, but just as a point of general knowledge, that's actually the point that um, defines um, Amer the American approach to abortion. Um, so in Roe v. Wade, what was determined is that you can only have abortions in the first trimester because up until that point, um, the fetus can't live on its own. So it's using somebody else's body and that person has bodily autonomy. They can make choices about their own body. But after that point, after which uh, the fetus can be independent of the woman's body, then um, you're not allowed to have an abortion. So just so you know, viability is kind of the law of the land right now, but he argues against it because he says that th there's too much variance in uh, viability that it can go from, say, 22 weeks to 32 weeks, and he's right about that. There is a lot of variability. Um, I think um, the earliest at which, you know, premature babies have survived is something like 26, 27 weeks, um, something like that. But there are variables that uh, influence um, the point of viability for, for fetuses of different times. And that also is largely contingent on the medical resources available. And if you have, you know, preemie, you know, units and things like that at hospitals, which are geared to serve um, babies that are born early. So he rejects that one. The second one he talks about is experience. 
like namely like when the fetus can experience something like feeling uh like a kick, like, or when, like, it could feel something externally, that's pretty far along in the development when, um, like, light and things like that can shine through, um, and that the, the baby seems to be responsive to its external environment, that's pretty far along a devi development, um, and he says, it's clear that there's something going on before that, so he says that's too late, um, then he talks about the sentiments of the child, so it's like how you feel about it, um, that that's the point at which it becomes a person. Um, he rejects that one because feelings are unreliable. Number four, he says, are the sensation by the parents, like namely when you can feel the baby kicking in you. This is for women. This is typically called quickening. That's what it used to be called. It's like a very 1800s word, quickening. Um, and he says that that's just not trustworthy because you just may not feel something when there is something there. He talks about social visibility and uh, rejects that point. And he says that there have been lots of people who have been socially uh, visible in society, but have still been denied their rights. Um, and so just because fetuses are not socially visible doesn't mean that they shouldn't have rights. Um, so he says that that's, that's too late. So then that gets him back to conception, which is the moment of which he calls the moment of fertilization. Um, and at this moment, um, when you have an egg, that is uh, permeated by a sperm, you get a zygote, and that's where you have now the new life with a new genetic code, and that is what has the right to life. That's when you become a person because you have an independent genetic code. So just to let you know how this article was written in 1970, our technology has advanced um, a lot um, in the last uh, 40 years or so, and so one problem with Noonan's argument, or maybe one unfortunate implication of Noonan's argument, is that um, for people who undergo IVF, IVF is when you um, basically make a zygote externally and then um, put it back in for incubation into the woman's body. Um, typically when uh, women extract eggs from their um, uter from their ovaries and you know, when you get the sperm and you do it externally, you usually take a several eggs. And so what will happen is that there will be, you know, four or five zygotes that are in a Petri dish waiting to get, you know, inserted back up into the womb. And they only put, you know, two or so up in at a time. What happens with this, those extra zygotes is that those are frozen and um, usually at the fertility clinics. And so there are millions of frozen um, zygotes that are all over America and some people are waiting to use them. Some people are long past the point at which they're going to use them, but they don't really know what to do with them, whether they should be discarded or something like that. But according to Noonan's view, those are frozen people. Like those, those are people with full moral rights that are frozen. Um, and if you worked in one of these labs and you accidentally knocked over, you know, some, a, a tray or something of, of these Petri dishes, you would have committed murder. So that is definitely the implication of Noonan's argument. And that may not square with some of our intuitions about personhood. So there would need to be revisions to Noonan's argument or something like that in order, if, if you wanted to defend that, and, or, or you could embrace those, um, conclusions, but just to think about those possibilities. And one of the other things he mentions is a probabilities argument, and he's arguing that, um, that the probabilities are pretty high once you get pregnant, that it'll actually turn into a human um, being, and that has a significant chance, and so if something has a significant chance of living, then you should, you should let it live, so that's called the probabilities argument. Um, so finally, the one objection to Noonan's argument has to do with the fact that he's uh, arguing about the potential um, for personhood. And so even though he's saying that, like, look, obviously a zygote is not sentient, it doesn't have, you know, um, feelings, it doesn't, can't, there's no, you know, higher evolution or anything. Uh, it still has the potential for rational thought. So you'll find that, um, I think it's at the, his positive arguments up at the top of page 102. So when you read there, um, 
then it's, you'll find that like, that's where he's given this potentiality argument. So some people say one problem with this argument is, well, if you're going to go for potential, why not say we should also, you know, keep all the eggs and all the sperm and, and those have substantive moral value in the same way that a zygote does, because all of the eggs and all the sperm also have a whole lot of potential to be persons. So um, that's Noonan's argument. I've just tried to give you an overview and a couple of um, objections that are typically given against it. And um, if you have additional questions about this essay, I'd like for you to sign in when we have our discussion on abortion and ask those questions. All right, thanks.